Uh, thanks everyone for being here. It's a really great honor to be here at Bongo Hive. Uh, so I'm Simant, and uh, I am indeed a recovering engineer, as Simunza said. Um, what that means to me, because uh, I made up the term, so <laughs> what that means to me is that um, even though in my career I've evolved sort of uh, doing things more than, than engineering um, in terms of customer support and product management, um, I often find that in various projects I have to come back and do engineering anyway. Um, part of it is kind of my love for technology um, and part of it is just love for hacking and creating things. Um, and so you can find me on Twitter and Google Plus at CMOTK, GitHub of course CMOTK, um, not Facebook because I don't really use it. Um, now, as Simota said, uh, I've been in Zambia now for about five weeks. I'm actually leaving tomorrow. Um, before this, I left 14 years ago, and I haven't been back since. And so the kinds of changes that I've seen have been absolutely incredible. Um, and so I'm going to walk you guys through some of what I've discovered, um, kind of my journey, my journey through those 14 years and kind of what I've discovered in Zambia. Um, really. Technical difficulties, sorry. Okay, there we go. So um, in 14 years, I mean, Zambia is like the physical face of Lusaka has changed, right? Manda Hill Mall wasn't a mall. It was grass when I left. Um, arcades was just all bush. And by the way, great, this is the first thing I noticed, is that Great East has, a, has roundabouts now, and one of them has a really big chicken in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was a bit of a surprise. Um, the other things that, that are kind of less obvious, and maybe you guys don't really see them because you're kind of here and going through the changes, uh, but the changes that I noticed immediately was kind of you know, driving around, walking around, um, kind of seeing in people's eyes that there's optimism and hope. Um, there's a lot, a lot more people are smiling. When I left 14 years ago, things were a little bit grim. Um, and so that, like, it's been really encouraging to return uh, to find a Zambia like this. Um, and this is one of the examples of, of the things that interest me. Um, so I'm obviously in the technology world. Um, I've spent most of my career in startups, except for one company. Um, I'm very, very, very interested in education and education technology. Uh, my roots are in open source. And uh, well, media and entertainment is just stuff we all like, right? Um, and Zambia has a plethora of all of these things, um, which is just interesting to me. And I'll talk about a little bit of them. Um, so in the past 14 years, I've been a developer for Gentoo Linux um, for seven of those, or five of those, or something like that. Um, so I joined when the project was very, very young. It was kind of a startup open source project. Um, it's completely volunteer driven. Um, not a single person get, gets paid. Um, and yet, these people get together online in usually IRC channels, where they just chat with each other. Um, and they create this fantastic distribution which, is, which has the highest ideals. Um, the ideals are sort of freedom of choice primarily, right? Like the freedom to create a computer and to behave the way it, that you want it to behave. Um, and so Linux in general is like that. Gentoo Linux in specific is, is very much more so. Um, it kind of personifies that because it allows you to build your Linux system from scratch exactly the way you want it, right? So completely customized. Um, so this is a visualization that I did, which is why I call myself a recovering engineer, because I did that this year. And I haven't been paid to be a software engineer for many years now. Um, so I did this for the Gentoo Linux project, which is kind of a visualization where each dot um, shows uh, one individual contributing to the project. And I encourage anybody interested in technology to, to explore open source. There's more to it than just Linux. Um, so. Gen2 led me to these companies. Um, I was shipped out from LA, where I was working on Gen2 Linux, again, for free, um, to Boston. I relocated to, to Boston to work at this company, Brontes. And what Brontes does is they make a device that looks like, a, like an electronic toothbrush, and it has a monitor attached to it. And as the dentist kind of waves this toothbrush-looking thing over your teeth, uh, you have a 3D image that forms of your mouth live on video on the screen. Um, and so this technology is useful for dentists and, and uh, orthodontists um, to create restorations. So if anybody's been to dentists and have had that nasty tray thing that you bite into, which causes you to throw up in many cases, that goes away, right? So this is, it's, this, is this kind of disruptive 3D technology. Um, 
I wound up here because of Gentoo Linux, right? So this was kind of a hacker kind of project I was a part of, and then suddenly they called me saying they're developing or they're developing this device and they're using Gentoo Linux to power it, um, and they needed an expert, so they invited me along. Um, Bronte subsequently got bought out by 3M for a very large sum of money, not much of which actually came into my pocket, but um, the so the, the feeling of, of validation was incredible from that, right? So suddenly we had this multinational company shipping disruptive 3D technology into, into the world powered by Gentoo Linux, right? Just wow. Um, so I did that. I was initially an engineer for both Brontes and 3M. Um, when we went to market, so we actually went to market with the device after we bought, got bought. Um, before we got bought, we just had con uh, concepts and kind of pre-production. When we got bought, um, we realized at launch time that there was no customer support. So we were going to launch, but they hadn't really thought about customer service, customer support. Um, and so being who I am, being, being Zambian, and I'll explain that in a little bit, and being from Gentoo, which I'll also explain in a little bit, um, this spoke very dear to my heart. Um, I, because I was looking at a device which is high tech, being sold to a bunch of people, dentists. If any of you have been to, into a dentist office, you've seen their, in, their instruments are kind of from the 15th, 14th century, right? They're pretty medieval. They're sharp steel instruments that poke and prod and stuff like that. High tech doesn't really belong in a dentist's office. And so I realized that in order to take this new paradigm of dentistry into a dentist's office, will require support, it'll require hand-holding. It'll require a gentle touch which dentists clearly don't have, but we needed to give them. Um, <laughs> and so I started up, I was kind of the founder of the customer support team, which is weird. So it was a little bit like a startup y environment again for me. Um, I was given two part-time employees, one part-time employee to begin with, um, which then I, I trained. Um, and so we successfully supported over 100 devices over the course of many years, of three years. Um, and our, our kind of claim to fame was that we were responsible for customer retention. So dentists would call us up, they'd be really frustrated with this device, they have a patient in the chair, they've spent a number of minutes, the scan's not going through, they don't know if it's working, and my team and I would walk them through and, and kind of hold their hand and get them through this stuff. Now that's the soft side of stuff, right? Um, the hard side of stuff is that um, these devices were powered by Linux, by Gentoo Linux, and so there was a lot of technical stuff that went on behind the scenes for my support team. Um, so I was hired, like I said, I was, I was given two part-time people. The budget I was given didn't really allow me to hire technical folks. So I did the next best thing. I hired bartenders, right? Uh, because bartenders, as you know, deal with people. That's what they do, day in, day out. They sell drinks to people and they listen to their stories. Um, and so I hired a bartender to, to be the first person on my support team. And uh, she did extremely well with that piece of it. She had no technical background, which is easy because I know Gentoo Linux, I can teach it. So that's what we did the first few months. We, we spent the first few months kind of her doing the front end sort of soft stuff while I was teaching her the real hard Linux stuff. And so by the end of two and a half years, she left pretty much an expert, at least in sort of the, the, the kinds of troubleshooting that were necessary for the device, um, which was a, a really great story for her. So to kind of close the 3M story off, um, 3M's a really big company, and so at some point they didn't want their team to be in Boston. They're, they're located in the middle of the snow belt in, in Minnesota, so they essentially came in and they shut down our office. They gave a few of us the choice of relocating to Minnesota, um, and so my team and I, we, none of us relocated because 30 below zero isn't really my idea of fun. Um, and so we kind of trained the, the next generation of support people to take that over. Um, that is, that the month that I spent doing that back and forth to, to Minnesota and, and Boston uh, was during the height of winter, or the low of winter, I guess. Um, so I've experienced 30 below, and it's the coldest I've ever been. I really don't want to ever experience it again. Um, so anyway, that led me on to this company, Engine Yard. Now, Engine Yard is one of those companies that I've always lamented that I don't really have a one word or a one sentence description, so I'm gonna try my best. Um, they, they operate in the realm of, of something called Ruby on Rails, which has, show of hands, how many people have, uh, know that? You don't count, because <laughs> nobody can see you. Who is, who's heard of that? 
four people, right? So four people in the room know, even know what Ruby on Rails is. I'm going to try and explain that. So Ruby is a, is a programming language. Um, just like C, C++, Java, you guys have heard of this. Um, so Ruby is a programming language that was written in Japan and it's, it's designed to be easy to read, easy to implement. And so it's, it's wonderful for beginners. Um, Rails is what made Ruby really popular. So Ruby, uh, Rails is a framework. Bear, go with me for a second. So <laughs> Rails is a framework um, which, here's what that means. It basically means that you can take a beginner programmer teach them a little bit of Ruby, a little bit of Rails, and then in maybe two, two hours, three hours max, they're, they're able to put up a dynamic website. Right? A website that, that responds to clicks and, and kind of behavior changes and, dynam and dynamism and, and all this stuff. More, more than just an HTML page, right, with Hello World on it. Um, and so Ruby on Rails is really popular right now, at least in the tech circles in San Francisco and, and the US. And so Engine Yard was one of the first companies to, to kind of capitalize on that. Um, Engine Yard, Ruby on Rails, that's where the kind of the analogy goes. Um, and so they, they use Gentoo Linux. Now they have thousands of customers. They use Gentoo Linux um, powering all their customers. Right, so like again, validation. And now we're talking, I'm, now this is, Seven years after I've left Gentoo Linux, I'm still hearing Gentoo Linux being used. People are still calling me about it. Um, so they called me not because of Gentoo Linux, the technology. They called me because of the customer service that I, that I introduced into Gentoo that made it popular in the first place. So they, uh, they called me in to kind of help them turn around their customer support department, um, which at the time was not doing very well. There, were, there was no metrics. They didn't really know how well or poorly they were doing. Um, what they did know is that customers were complaining and then leaving because of the support experience. Um, so that clearly wasn't working for them. So they hired me to kind of help them turn that around. Um, so long story short, I helped them turn that around. Um, we kind of, I just re-injected this, this idea of, which I'll get to, and again, this is Zambian roots, Gen 2 roots. Um, I re-injected this idea of valuing your employees, right? Valuing the people that work for your team. Um, realizing that people are not just, and I hate the term human resource because, the, really? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what that means, but it's, it's just depersonalizing it. Um, but these, like, these are people, these are living, breathing people with families and friends and, and things they like, things they don't like, people who fall in love, you know, like, th these are people. Um, and so that's how I connected with them. We just made eye contact. Um, it's a remote team, so I flew around the world kind of making eye contact with them, fulfilling some promises that had been made by my predecessors, um, and just kind of turning things around and empowering them a little bit. Uh, so it took us four months to go from no metrics to introducing metrics, getting not really great results somewhere in the 70s as far as customer satisfaction, uh, to ending the year uh, with 98% customer satisfaction with the same team. Right, so there was no firing, no, none of that stuff. It was just reconfiguring the team a little bit, psychologically and emotionally. Um, so that was kind of my biggest success at, Gen at Engine Yard. Um, after I achieved that, they, uh, they asked me to take part in the product management side of it. Product management, at least in the software world, because we didn't ship a physical product, um, meant kind of designing the experience that the customer would have when they deployed on Engine Yard. So, from the UI, from the user interface, right, the physical kind of things that are on screen, to the workflow, the user experience, to customer support, all of that was one kind of customer experience that I was kind of, I was asked to design for the next generation. Um, what happened shortly after I joined product management was that the team itself vaporized, leaving me kind of the only product manager available. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I was responsible for product managing the entire thing. Um, so I, essentially, I kind of reintroduced product management, which, was, which involved rebuilding bridges between engineering, which if you guys have worked with engineers or are engineers, you know they're very moody people. As a recovering engineer, I know I am. So it, it involved rebuilding bridges between engineering, sales, marketing, um, product management, and customer support. Um, so I did that and I kind of introduced uh, this idea of, of releases and kind of took care of, of the ticketing queue and just kind of brought some order to chaos. Um, but doing all of that made me kind of exhausted and in all, in all honesty a little bit burned out. So uh, in the middle of last year I kind of put a stop to that um, and I kind of talked with my parents and they said, you know, just come home. Come home and recover. And so it had been 14 years 
and uh, I thought it was a pretty good idea. So December 5th, I came here. Um, and actually, let's find out what's on this. Oh, okay, okay. So Zambia and Gentoo Linux were at the center of all this stuff. Um, and I came back home to Zambia. Um, and so I just wanted, to, I, I want to go through a little bit of the journey that I went through in Zambia and talk about how I learned about these three things being Zambian, right? And being Gentoo Linux. So both of those things, Gentoo is kind of my technological home, Zambia is my sort of emotional home. Um, I had a very interesting experience at Unza yesterday. So I, I, I went there uh, to, to do an interview with someone and there was no parking. Right? There was, I couldn't park any, it was all full. So I turned into, the, into the, the car park, we call them here, right? Not parking lot, car park. And, um, and the security guy, he was very nice and he greets me and I said, look, I, 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 I'm going to be here for an hour. I, I'm doing an interview. Where can I park? And so he said, oh, go over there. And I said, yeah, what, where over there? It's full. And he goes, okay. So here's what he did. He walked. So he's walking and then he gives me the follow me sign. So I'm following him in my car. So we walk halfway down the parking lot. He sees nothing, comes back to me and says, all right, I have an idea. Turns around, has me turn around and follow him. And he says, go park on the curb, just go climb on the curb over there, park there. I'll watch your car, you'll be fine. Right, and I look at him, I'm like, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I got this, don't worry about it. And so I parked my car down, the, you know where the students come down the stairs from the library, like there. I parked in front of them and he watched my car for an hour. He didn't ask me for anything. He asked me for nothing. But he gave that just, I mean, he thought out of the box, he, thought, he saw I was in a problem, and he delivered, right? More than I would have expected. Um, and he, made, he had me park as close as possible. Um, so that right there is a customer experience, right? That's a customer support thing. And that, to me, in my experience, isn't unique, or is, isn't a unique experience in, in Zambia. It's a unique experience as, like, for, like, Zambia is unique in the world for being able to deliver that kind of experience, I think is what I want to say. Um, so that's what Zambia taught me about customer support um, and product management because customer support, product management, I, I describe myself as sitting at the nexus of the two. Um, one is the back end after the customer buys, product management is the front end before they buy. I mean, it's, it's the same stuff though. Um, and technology, so technology is, is the thing that kind of is the reason why we're having this talk in the first place. So when I was coming to, to Zambia, um, I participated in Startup Weekend, which as I was doing it, I found out was a global event. And so while I was over there doing this thing, it's a 56 hour thing that happens over the weekend where you start from, from pitching an idea to, to delivering a proof of concept that you can pitch to investors at the end of it. Um, and it's all done within 56 hours. So it's a very intense thing. And they said, oh, it's part of a global challenge. And I said, oh, well, global, let me Google Zambia. And so I did. Um, and what I found is that there's this outfit called Bongo something, Bongo Hub, Hive something. Um, and Because it wasn't clear and I was in a hurry. Uh, but they were doing this startup weekend thing. So I went to their website and there was no information. Nothing at all, right? So I was like, all right, well, I, I, I don't know. Um, and I didn't know Facebook at the time. I didn't realize how big it is in Zambia. Um, but yeah, let's catch up. So um, when I landed, I remembered that there was this bongo something that I have to come and see, I have to check out. So um, my first, first or second night, we had some family friends over and I just kind of mentioned, I was like, I, I need to find this bongo place. And they said, we know where it is. <laughs> so we know exactly where it is. And so they had me follow them in their car and we drove here at, I don't know, 10 at night, 11 at night. Was it something like that? And so they drove us by and they said, there's the wall. See the, see the name? There's the wall. Um, and so the very next morning, I drove into this place um, and I came and met Lukonga. Um, and I sat down and I said, tell me everything. <laughs> um, he said, what do you want to know? I said, everything, the whole story. And so Lukonga was, was gracious enough um, to just, unannounced, right? No, no appointment. He's just sitting in his office. I don't, he doesn't know me. Um, and so he spent the next two and a half hours telling me the story of Bongo Hive, right, and why this place came together. And, and then he introduced me to Silo Messi, he introduced me to Simunza, um, the other co-founders of Bongo Hive. And between the three of them, they have made me feel just incredibly welcome. 
um, made me feel completely at home. And I met, I've met all of the other, bon well, most of the other Bongo Hive members, like Charles and, and George over there with the snappy pictures, um, and Francis over here. So, and I've had a chance to even talk with them and, and just kind of get their stories. And so one day we're sitting around at, at a table over here. It's, it's Sulu Macy, me, and this kid, Daryl. And Daryl's telling me his story about starting up this project that he and Charles are starting up called um, Hackers Guild. And Hackers Guild is one of those peer-to-peer -peer education type ideas. Um, basically, what they, were, what they were expressing is that the universities aren't preparing kids to be programmers, you know, to, to exist in the real world. They're getting taught things like Java, which who out there actually uses Java anymore? Um, and for what? Um, you're an exception. <laughs> um, but enterprise Java, I guess, is, is what I want to say. Um, and so we have these, pr these programmers. In some cases, they're saying that they don't even have access to computers when they're going through their courses, right? So Hackers Guild was founded to kind of solve this problem or answer this problem of lack of education, lack of resources, lack of mentorship, lack of, of a team. And so they bring together people to just teach each other how to program stuff. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful idea. Um, some of the best learning I ever did as a kid was around my friends. Like, I, I remember one teacher, right? But the rest of it was my friends. That's where we learned from, because that was fun. Um, teachers just sit up there and, to borrow your phrase, I mean, education is mostly chalk and talk, right? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, and so this idea of kind of peer-to-peer -peer education just really spoke to my heart. And so I talked with Daryl a little bit, and we kind of got his story. He dropped out of medical school to do this and you know, kind of upset his parents, but he was doing what he loved. And so as he's telling me this story, I could relate to parts of it. Because um, I, like, I haven't worked a single day in the actual major that I majored in in, in college, um, which was optics, and I've, I've not done a single day of that ever. Um, so clearly there was some disappointment that you can ask them about later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I could relate to it. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, like this is a great story. And it, I, I've known tons of people in my life that have gone through this stuff. So I'd like to start telling it. I'd like, I'd like other people to be able to hear it. Like people Daryl's age, right? He's in early, his early 20s. Um, so, so with Sulemesi there, I looked at him and I'm like, what do you think of a podcast? Right? I'm like, what, if you think, what do you think if we just start collecting these stories and just putting them together? And Sulemesi, who is, I describe as the ultimate enabler, right? The ultimate encourager, um, just did exactly that. He encouraged and enabled. Um, he didn't shoot the idea down. He actually thought about it with me. We discussed it a little bit. Um, and then I said, Sulemesi, I need to meet more people. <laughs> and sure enough, Sulemesi to the rescue. Um, he's also the connector, right? So he. Um, introduced me to just a ton of people. He introduced me to uh, this guy, Matt, who runs Startup Junction. And through Startup Junction, I attended an event and met Cassie and Vicky over there, right? Um, I had family friends. So through family, I met Mark Bennett um, because he was colleagues with, with my mom and some other people from the university. Um, and then most of the rest of the people I've met have been, oh, and I met Chintu at Startup Junction. Um, and then most of the other people I've met have been through, uh, through Bongo Hive. Um, these people come in here and they just sit around and hack and learn and talk and they watch TED videos and they watch CES coverage and there's just this incredible energy at Bongo Hive which I think is just supreme. Um, these are some of the companies that I've met that have really kind of affected me. Right? These are like conversations that I've had in the podcast have been, I describe them as interviews initially but they're not really interviews, they're, they're kind of chats. Um, and it was, the, the idea has always been to kind of sit on the couch and just converse, right? Just be people and converse. And some of the, like I've had such an emotional time talking with, with people. I mean, Cassie, <laughs> our talk was amazing, right? Um, and so Cassie, Cassie and Vicky run shopz.com. Um, I cannot wait to publish this story. It's such a beautiful story. Um, and and I, I only wish we could have pictures of the reaction, so I, I'm going to talk with you after about that. Um, you know, I talked with Monica, who runs Java Foods, and introduced easy noodles, right? Ramen noodles, which in the West we take for granted, right? And which when she launched, when she launched Java Foods and in easy noodles, she got told, no, it'll never work in Zambia. 
It just won't work. Zambians won't go for it. As Zambians eat in Shima. They're not going to eat noodles. <laughs> um, and yet she did it, and she's a success. And she's like, this stuff is actually being sold because it, it speaks to a need. Um, at, start, at the Startup Junction Happy Hour, I met Chintu. And Chintu reminds me of a tank, right? Not just in, like, clearly he looks like one, but like, he's built like one. <laughs> but it's his, I think he, it's his, physical, it, the, his physical manifestation is from what's up here, right? This is a guy who, like Timex, he'll take a ticking and keep on licking, or keep on, I don't know. There's a tick and a lick somewhere in there, and he keeps doing it. Um, what it means is, like, he'll get knocked down, and he'll get right back up again, right? Always. Like, he, the, he doesn't understand the word failure. It doesn't exist for him. Um, so just super inspiring. Um, Mark Bennett in high school. Like the, he was my, actually my, the first person that I interviewed was Mark, who was gracious enough to accept and say, yeah, come and talk to me in my office. And like, I mean, I felt ashamed because like, I'd seen, I'd seen the, the Zedu pad um, I, at, at Manda Hill the, the second day that I was in Zambia. I went to the Manda Hill Mall because I was like, hey, it's not, a, it's not grass anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's two stories. So we went up onto the second story, came down the, the escalator, and there's this, I don't know, it's this little thing which has ads on it, the, the change. And I saw this thing, ice cool in the Zedu pad, and I was like, what? That, I've never seen that in the US. What do you mean Zedu pad? It's, there's no such thing in the US. And so that interested me immediately. And I, I went to talk with, with Mark. And he told me some of his story, which again, I can't wait to publish. Um, but here's Mark who, if I can be so sort of, if I, if I have the liberty, you're an idealist, right? You're, you're doing this stuff to help people. Um, when we talked, he couldn't stop talking about, about the kids that are, that are being touched by this, by this technology, right? And kids out, out in the middle of nowhere, who are picking up the, the Zedu pad, having never seen technology before, picking it up, did you say within five minutes they're playing around with the settings already, figuring out how to break it? <laughs> right? um, and so, like, I mean, that's, that's the world we live in, is technology. And it's, it's people like you guys that I've met that have just been inspiring to me about the Zambian story and Zambia's place. Um, and so I, I got pearls of wisdom from just about every conversation that I had. Um, if I had to summarize the theme that, is, that binds every one of my interviews, this list would be it, right? Believe in yourself, make networks, like care about people, have them care about you, tell your story, hear their stories, fail, right? And persist, fail and then get up again. And most of all, <laughs> this was the important one, was start now. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.